Good afternoon. Um, you are in the programmatic track here at Black Hat again, room uh, Milano 1234. Uh, this talk is Attacking Java Clients by Stephen DeVries, who is the Principal Security Consultant at Corsair. All right, take it away. Thanks so much, Ricky. Um, everyone's aware that Hacking ATM is, is in a different room, right? So uh, this is boring old Java going on here. And uh, basically, what I'd like to present is an approach and a methodology to attacking Java clients. And I'll present this approach from uh, attacking a client from a black box perspective, so not having any access to the source code and not relying on decompiling to, uh, to gain access to the, to the code in turn. I'll also only be using high-level developer tools, so no directly editing bytecode, so you don't actually need to understand any bytecode to be able to attack Java clients. And then I'll only be using uh, open source development tools as well. Right, so uh, Java is, is the new COBOL, right? You know, it's, uh, it's a boring, it's an old technology. And it's precisely because it's such a, a boring and uh, state technology that financial institutions, uh, conservative organizations, um, organizations that, that really don't want to be at the bleeding edge of, uh, of technologies, you know, they want to try something that's been uh, tried and tested, they'll stick to using Java clients. And we see a lot of Java clients still in um, banking applications, in trading applications, in commercial banking applications. And from a vulnerability point of view, what is interesting about uh, Java clients is that often the security controls are built into the client side instead of onto the server side. And this is something that modern development environments make quite easy for developers. Well, it's easy for them to make the mistake of uh, putting trusted code in the client side instead of on the server side. So we see things like this, for example. Uh, on the client side, if logged in, then user ID equals get the logged in user from a server and then place an order on the server using this user ID and an order. So this is an example of state being stored on the client side. User ID and logged in are both local client side variables. And if you can get into the client and you can manipulate these variables, if you can manipulate these fields, then you can change the way that this client server application is meant to work. And this code looks fine to a developer. You know, if you look at this, it, it works, it's fine. Uh, the problem is just that if you assume that the client is untrusted, which is the case, all clients are untrusted, um, then you can, you can potentially um, circumvent the logic of the, of the client and the server. So when I'm talking about Java clients here, I'm referring to all types of Java clients. That's applets, uh, applications, JNLP applications, and even the new JavaFX, which is really just a redressed Java. Uh, the difference in terms of running these on the client is you might have a slightly different permissions by default uh, on the clients, but you can change these. I mean, it's, it's your client, so you can change the permissions to, to whatever you like. The point is that all of these are valid Java bytecode running on normal Java runtime environments, and all of them uh, are subject to, the, to this approach. All the techniques I'll be explaining will work to all of them. So when we're looking at typical client-server application for Java, we have things like uh, client-side over here, server-side over here. You have the JRE, the client run, running on the JRE, and then some kind of remoting interface here, the actual remoting transport, and then the server-side. And Java is quite a feature-rich language, so there are loads of libraries and, and loads of different options you can use for both the client and the server-side. For the transport, same thing. There's loads of different transports you can use. IOP over socket, IOP over HTTP, even a completely bespoke transport that the developer has invented for this particular application. And of course, EJB and RMI on the client side. Or something invented specifically for this application. The point I'm trying to make is that if you want to try and intercept the communication between the client and the server, trying to go after the transport is quite difficult. You need to intercept a whole lot of different potential transports. Um, the approach I'm going to take is to go at the client itself. So once you are inside the client, if we can get access to the client itself over here, 
we can then use whatever remoting interface is available and talk to the server and then try and attack the server and try and circumvent the logic that's in the client. So some of the problems when, uh, when you're doing a security assessment or when you're trying to attack a Java uh, client, some of the issues you can run into are things like input validation. If you uh, are testing a web app, it's really easy to circumvent the input validation. You can just uh, directly manipulate the parameters, no problem. Doing that same thing on a Java client is a lot more difficult because you don't have access to those fields. You don't have access to those methods. The GUI also gets in the way of doing automated attacks. So it's difficult to, to do things like a, a brute force attack or enumeration attacks and so on. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the remoting transport itself is difficult to intercept. Saying that, uh, Manish Sandane released a tool at Black Hat Europe which will let you intercept serialized objects of RMI. So if the application is using RMI um, and serialized objects, you can use this plugin to, to intercept that communication. If, you, if the application is using something else, if it's using spring remoting or if it's using uh, a different type of remoting technology, well, then you can't intercept it. Decompilers, I think, is, is quite a popular way to go about assessing a Java client. As soon as you find a Java client, the first thing to do is throw a decompiler at it and see what comes back. Problem is it doesn't work 100%. And even if it did work, say, 99%, you still wouldn't have recompilable code. So you'd have to try and reinvent that 1% that couldn't be uh, decompiled and then try and recompile the client, make your changes to it, recompile that again. It's extremely tedious. So the approach I'm going through is basically divided into two stages. Firstly, we want to understand the client logic. We want to understand how the application works, what are the important classes, and how the execution flow goes. And secondly, we then want to be able to manipulate the fields and the methods inside that application. And I'll break this down into a further three steps. Information gathering, probing and analysis, where we take a bit more active role. We actually want to see um, how the execution flow of the application is happening. And then thirdly, the exploit is where we actually try and uh, circumvent the application. A bit more detail about what we're trying to do in each of these. Information gathering, we just want to find out uh, what are the interesting classes. By interesting, I mean where is the business logic. We're not interested in all the libraries and you know, open source tools and so on that are included in, in this Java application. We just want to go after the core business logic. So where, where is that logic? Secondly, we also want to find out what are the methods that are um, available on the server side. So what, which methods are exposed uh, by the server? And where is the comms layer? It ties up with, with the previous one. We really just want to find out how do we call the server-side methods. Probing and analysis is uh, looking a bit more in depth at the flow of the application. So we want to know where is the interesting execution flow? Where is the, sec the, the key security logic? Is there any security logic in the client? There really shouldn't be. All the security logic should be on the server side. So we want to try, try and identify if there is a key business logic or key security logic in the client. And then finally, for this approach, um, I'm using the technique of injecting a shell into the application. So we need to try and identify where's going to be the most convenient point to inject that shell. The exploitation, as I said, is going to be injecting a shell and then um, in, uh, in runtime trying to patch the application. Or another technique is going to be static patching. If you want to override a method permanently, you can also do that. Both of those will be bypassing the client-side controls. Finally, once we're inside the app, we can then use the comms layer that's there to uh, try and attack the server side. So we're, we're free of the restrictions of input validation and so on, and we can try uh, brute force attacks, uh, injection attacks, and so on on the server side. The tools I'll be using is the Eclipse Test and Performance Tools Platform, TPTP. And that's basically a profiler with some other tools mainly used uh, just to find out how a Java application runs. Uh, and then some Eclipse plugin, the JD decompiler plugin, and Aspect J tools. Uh, I still see a lot of people using JAD for decompilation, which really doesn't work. It's, it's uh, many years since it's been updated. JD decompiler is written in Java, and it works on the, the newer JREs. Um, it's released both as a plugin and as a standalone app, and it's quite good. Then we'll also be using the Beanshell and uh, the Java Object Inspector. 
And I guess the star of the show is Aspect J. Aspect J will let us manipulate a lot of, of uh, Java code without understanding bytecode. Right, and I'm going to do a walkthrough through, well, I'm going to be demonstrating this through an application. And it's a very simple app. Client server application, the server side is a Glassfish server. And the user logs in. So user logs in, they can click on an order and they can view where their order was shipped to and where their order was billed to. Okay, quite simple. There are two users, there's Bob and there's Alice. Okay, and Alice can see these orders and Bob can see the others. Right, quite simple. But immediately, just from that simple functionality, we already have a number of attack scenarios that, that stand out. Firstly, can Bob see Alice's orders? Those were just order numbers. So, uh, you know, can we manipulate the application so that one user can see another user's orders? Can we perform SQL injection attacks using any of those fields? And, for example, can we do an automated attack like uh, brute force attack of login credentials? Now, Obviously, to do something like the access control test, we can only click on order numbers here. So if I wanted to try and access Bob's numbers, the GUI just won't let me do it. It, it gets in the way, right? Similarly, if I wanted to try uh, SQL injection, let's try simple SQL injection and login, blank password. Right, so there's some kind of validation going on on the server side, or on the client side. Well, we don't know. It might be on the client, might be on the server. It's not letting us enter um, the characters to, to attempt SQL injection on the login form. So these are the kind of issues that we, we run into with, uh, with Java clients. So step one is information gathering. What we're simply going to do is um, have a look at the content of the jar files. So the first place we start is on the, the program launcher. In this case, it's a, it's a batch file. If it was an applet, the launcher would be uh, in, the, um, in the HTML source code, or JNLP, it would be in the JNLP file. The point is you always have um, a launcher, and the launcher would show you the class path and the main method. So the class path here already gives us some information. Remember what we're trying to identify here is we want to find out uh, where are the interesting classes, where's the business logic, um, and identify a point where we can inject our, uh, our shell. So by doing a quick Google of the available jar files, we'll see that all of these belong to Glassfish. So we can ignore those. This is a common library. We'll ignore that. These two, admin bean.jar and admin client.jar, uh, are bespoke, and this is the main method. So we know admin bean and admin client are of interest to us, and those are the ones we want to focus our attention on. So you open up Eclipse and just start a blank project, add the two jar files so that we can just have a convenient way to browse through them. So the main class, this was the main entry point. Not very interesting, it has a main method, has a launch GUI method. More interesting is client form. So this has got a lot more fields and methods in it. And Eclipse will show us by the red here that this is a private field, right? The green will show that this is a public method. So it shows all private methods. These look like GUI methods. So client form looks like it's probably part of the, the GUI of the application. Right. The other interesting bit was admin bean, and if we look at that, it has an interesting interface. This interface has got methods, get order with an int, get order IDs oops, with a string, and login string string. Now it's an interface, right? If I double click this, 
uh, JDD